Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're going to be talking about the ubiquitous 5-inch 38 caliber gun. We've covered this in previous videos. Uh, however, I don't believe we've ever gone through the whole thing in one video. So we decided now was a good time, and many of you are new viewers to the channel, so maybe you haven't gone back and watched all 600 and some odd uh, previous videos. So, in today's video, we're going to cover everything from the range finders through the fire control computers and up through the various magazines and hoists that get you into the gunhouse itself. And we're doing this in memory of Stanley Smokowitz, who was uh, a five inch gunner during World War II on the battleship Nevada and the light cruiser Amsterdam. The Smokowitz family is sponsoring this video in his memory. Their patriarch served at D-Day on the battleship Nevada, and then when Amsterdam was being commissioned and sent to the Pacific, because he was already an experienced gunner, he was transferred to form the core of the new crew on that vessel. So we'll look at some of the spaces on battleship New Jersey that would have been very similar to where he worked on board Nevada and Amsterdam. So the five inch 38 is a dual purpose gun. Battleship New Jersey was built with 10 twin mounts for it, like the one you see behind me. In the 80s, four of those mounts were removed, uh, but even today as a museum ship, she still has six of those mounts that have been used for well over 50 years. In fact, we can still fire some of them today. This gun is uh, manually operated and extremely robust and very, very effective. It proved a tremendous anti-aircraft weapon uh, the only real weapon in the U.S. Navy that could destroy kamikazes completely at the end of World War II, uh, and just an all-around excellent gun that served from the attack on Pearl Harbor all the way through the surrender of Japan, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the first Gulf War, and a hundred other conflicts in between. So I'm sure there are folks watching right now who have worked on this gun or seen this gun fired, uh, let us know in the comments section down below. On a battleship, the five inch guns make an excellent supplement to the main battery. The 16 inch guns are slow at turning and are only good against surface targets. So the five inch guns form the core of the anti-aircraft defense and also protect against small boats and with a 10 mile range can help with shore bombardment in situations where you don't need to drop one ton of hate on your enemy. They are extremely fast firing and uh, fast to aim. They are so effective that the Navy continued to man and operate these well into the 80s and 90s. So it's impossible to talk about the 5 inch 38 without talking about its associated director, the Mark 37. This is the inside of one of these directors where there would be about six guys. Uh, and they are aiming the guns. On Battleship New Jersey, our four 5-inch directors are called Sky 1, like the one we're in, uh, on the forward part of the superstructure, Sky 2 on the port side of the funnel, Sky 3 on the starboard side, and Sky 4 all the way aft. They're called Sky because they're dual purpose. You can uh, aim them at aircraft or at surface ships. The Mark 38 directors that aim the 16-inch guns are called Spot one, two, and three. The director turns towards a target and that gives you the bearing to that target. And then it has an optical piece like this round tube that spans the whole width of the director. That tells you the range. And of course, by uh, early in World War II, they also had radars mounted on top of them uh, that could also give you the range to the target. The Mark 37 was one of a series of directors used by the US Navy, but it became the dominant five inch director during World War II. Uh, battleships like New Jersey or Nevada had four of them, as did most of the cruisers. Uh, carriers, destroyers, any ship armed with five inch guns just about had at least one or two of these for directing their main battery guns. Early in World War II, Nevada had an older uh, Mark 34 director for her five inch gun. She had a pair of those mounted on each side of the forward 
superstructure just below the forward tripod mast when she undergoes her refit repairing damage after the attack on Pearl Harbor she gets the uh, 5 inch 38 in place of her older 5 inch 25 caliber guns and she gets uh, the excellent Mark 37 directors and she carries them throughout the rest of her career. Battleship New Jersey was built with four of these in the design and she used them uh, throughout her entire career even into the 90s with relatively small changes throughout. At, at certain points they added a hood over the uh, director captain's booth so he could stick his head out with a little bit of protection. Uh, they added a new radar on top at one point uh, in the 50s. So relatively small changes that aren't really changing how this works. The director itself sits on top of an armored tube that one gets it up six stories so that uh, it's got a good field of view and two provides a wiring trunk that all the information coming up to and out of this director can be transmitted through. The directors are cross-connected and they all feed into uh, plotting rooms so that you can take the data from the directors and put them in your fire control computers. So the director finds the range and bearing to the target and transmits it down the wiring trunk into a space like this one. This is forward secondary battery plot. The forward plot implies there is an aft plot and that is true on Iowa class battleships. There are two rooms uh, relatively identical to this. Older battleships, the South Dakotas, the North Carolinas, uh, and Nevada for that matter, would have just had one plotting room deep inside the ship. We've gone from uh, basically six stories up in the superstructure and we are now four stories down in the hall. So we, we've gone down 10 stories through the ship into the armored citadel where our plotting room is. The first important feature in here is the wall of switches. This is how we're determining that we're going to take information from director number one and plug it into computer number one and that computer is then going to send its signal to the port side battery or the starboard side batteries or only mount 53. But, um, it, it doesn't really matter. You can cross connect this system a dozen different ways as you can see from all of these switches. We've now set up that we want the signal from that rangefinder transmitted to this computer. We want this computer to transmit to a certain number of guns. Let's look at the computer. This amazing piece of technology is called the Ford Mark I Able. It's not made by Ford Motor Company, it is Ford Instrument Company. Uh, and it was designed and developed during the Great Depression. And it's an electromechanical analog computer. So we open this up and it's full of cams and gears. There's no digital components whatsoever. And turning these dials is going to make those various cams and gears do different things to give us a solution. This thing is amazing. Uh, the tag on it says that it was manufactured in 1942, although some of these existed a little bit earlier than that. And this one was used for half a century. So this computer just doesn't break. It, they, the US Navy kept using it on Iowa class battleships for half a century, and it was in use on other ships for a similar length of time. They're a really amazing system. And uh, basically an overglorified abacus, this thing can plot a firing solution in three dimensions. So whereas the Mark 8 aims the 16 inch guns is plotting a two dimensional solution, you're aiming at another surface target. Uh, so you only have two planes to deal with X and Y. This also deals with a Z axis so that uh, you can engage aircraft in addition to surface targets. Uh, and you're not just trying to arc a shell from here to land there, you're trying to make it explode in front of where an aircraft is flying. So there is a lot going on here. It can also plot a firing solution for star shells. So you fire that over an enemy warship and it explodes behind them, backlighting them so you can see them, but they cannot see you. Uh, and, and that's what this big piece bolted on the top is. Uh, so a really special and sophisticated uh, piece of technology. Iowa class battleships would have had four of these. Um, older battleships had just two or three. 
and then smaller ships might only have one. So the Ford Mark I Able has just given us an incredibly precise fire control solution. I say precise because it may not be accurate. If we put bad data in, the input we get out will be a precise solution for that data, but it might not be on target. So definitely precise, maybe even precise and accurate. The issue is our firing platform is not stable. Iowa-class battleships have a high length to beam ratio, uh, and they're in the middle of the ocean, so they rock and roll a lot. So the trigger console, and there are a couple of other places to fire the guns besides here, but this is the main one. The, the trigger console here is gyroscopically stabilized. So there is a gyroscope in this box that is telling you if the ship is level or not. So first, you would pull the salvo signal key. This is an alarm that goes off around the ship to tell them, I'm about to shoot a five inch gun. Uh, and then you've got the automatic firing key, the pineapple. I depress this trigger, I'm just going to hold it. Uh, and at this point, something might happen, something might not happen. If the gyroscope says that the ship is level, it will allow the firing circuit to close, and any guns that are loaded and cross-connected to this console will go off. Uh, if it's not loaded, or the ship is rocking, or any number of other things are happening, the firing circuit is not closed. Uh, so I could just sit here and hold this throughout an engagement, and the guns will just keep firing automatically at an aircraft. There's also a hand fire key right here, which I could press to cause the guns to fire without taking into account gyroscopic stabilization. So we get into a anti-aircraft battle during a typhoon, unlikely, uh, but we just want to be shooting and we're rocking too much to do that. Can use the hand fire key. Or gyroscope isn't functioning, for whatever reason, we, we've got aircraft coming from multiple directions, so the other gyroscopic stabilizers are, are in use for different batteries, and it, we can just hand fire it. Or, more likely what it was used for, we're firing a salute. We're, we're not actually in combat. We, we just want to fire a 21-gun salute or something for a photo opportunity. Battleships are very photogenic. There's your key. Ammunition handling for the five inch guns is very similar to for the 16 inch guns, which we talk about a lot on this channel. The powder is stored in a separate magazine and it comes in aluminum canisters. Whereas the aluminum canisters for the 16 inch guns hold silk powder bags, the five inch canisters actually hold a brass or sometimes steel or aluminum cartridge. That cartridge weighs about 22 pounds and is about 15 pounds of powder and seven pounds of metal. So in the magazine or while you're doing handling, you keep it in the aluminum canister, which has a lid that can unscrew so you can pull that uh, cartridge out. That comes later. In here, these canisters are stacked floor to ceiling and we've got the same sort of chilled water radiator system in the overhead that you see in other magazines on the ship. So when we are ready to pass ammunition up to the gun, we take the whole canister and we're passing it through a scuttle in the door like this one. At that point, somebody in the other half of the magazine where the shells are stored takes over. As built, Iowa-class battleships had 10 twin mounts for five-inch guns. Those 10 mounts were fed from six magazines. All the magazines are accessible off of Broadway on third deck of the ship and are over engineering spaces. Some of the magazines have uh, four dredger hoists because they're feeding two twin mounts and others only had two. Uh, so really there was a magazine on each side, forward and aft, uh, that had four and then one amidships on each side that only had two dredger hoists. There's a separate dredger hoist for each barrel of the five inch gun. In the 80s, they removed four of these twin turrets to make room for the uh, modern missile systems. And when they did that, they removed the two amidships magazines and they removed four of the hoists from the aftermost magazines. So this one, the forward port side five inch magazine is still feeding 
two guns, and so it has four dredger hoists in it. If you look at a blueprint for these ships, you'll see that the magazines are not mirrored, so they, they show up on different places along Broadway, even though I'm saying they're fore and aft, port and starboard. Uh, they, they are offset. Uh, Iowa-class battleships are not symmetrical. Nobody is. The shells are relatively inert, and they're stored in here with the uh, hoists. They are stored in uh, racks, like you can see behind me, or over here, or over there, and they're just stacked right on top of each other. These things have a nose fuse, but it's not set yet, so they're relatively inert. It's a lot of metal and very little explosive D in there, uh, so these are relatively safe. We're not too worried about an explosion coming down the hoist and blowing up the whole room. It's not like the powder where we do store that in a separate room and it's always closed between those two uh, with the exception of that passing scuttle. Right here um, is a BLMP round, blind loaded and plugged. We know that because it's painted blue. Notice it still has the brass base ring on it, so it is a real projectile that we can uh, fire from the guns and you would use these to fire in training. Instead of having explosive D on the inside, it has sand so that it is the appropriate weight, which is uh, somewhere between 54 and 55 pounds for a five inch projectile. These projectiles come in a ton of different varieties. Uh, some of them have different nose fuses. Some of them have different explosives on the inside. Some of them aren't really designed to engage enemy uh, ships at all. So for example, star shells are just an illumination round. They've got a uh, magnesium flare in there with a parachute that deploys. Uh, we, we've got all sorts of other sorts of explosives and they're all painted up in different colors. Uh, so when you're down here, you select which color projectile you have uh, based on whatever firing mission you've been told. And you put it on the hoist, you kick this foot pedal and it will open the doors of the hoist so that this will fall right in. The dredger hoist was one of those war-winning innovations of the U.S. Navy. It uh, can curve and it can take almost any size projectile or powder. So if we were armed with three inch guns with a fixed casing, that would fit in here. If we were armed with six inch guns that are semi-fixed, like our five inch run, that would work in here. Uh, so all of the major small calibers could use the exact same hoist. And uh, as this hoist is going from here to its gun, it's got to do some curves to get up to it. Those curves are important for two reasons. Uh, one, it lets this hoist feed that gun uh, even though it might not be directly overhead. And two, it means if there's an explosion and it hits that hoist, it's not necessarily going to come straight down. It's probably going to uh, keep going straight so when this curves, it's going to blow out the side of the hoist instead of blowing all the way down in the magazine. So it gives you some added safety with powder handling. You can never be safe enough when you're handling powder. The dredger hoist has uh, something of a conveyor belt inside, and it just has some, some little, little paws in there that this would be continuously running when we're in operation, and you're just throwing stuff in, and then when one of those poles comes up, it grabs the projectile or the powder canister. You can put either in here. I've heard on some ships they used one hoist for shells, one hoist for powder, and I've heard on other ships they would just alternate shells and powder. So it, it seems to depend on uh, which ship you were on and, and uh, what the chief gunner's mate had in mind. Uh, but you can fit all sorts of different sizes in here, and the Paul just grabs it and hoists it all the way up, upper handling arm. Yeah, so earlier I said that uh, the shells are relatively inert, and so they're stored right with the hoists. Well, that's not true of all of the different types of projectiles that the five inch guns can fire. Uh, we are in a WP magazine right now, or Willie Pete. Uh, these shells fire highly incendiary white phosphorus rounds. And so they are stored, if they're being carried, separately from the rest. So here you can see the dredger hoist passing through the armored deck and 
heading on towards where its gun is. Like I said, it can do a curve. You can see a projectile inside of it with those little uh, paws that are grabbing it on the way up. And this will just take it straight up to the gun. It's gonna do another angle over there and then head up to its gun mount. On smaller ships, these dredger hoists might not be armored, but on the battleship, you can see we use two and a half inch STS, special treatment steel, to armor uh, these hoists so that uh, they're, they're relatively safe from splinter damage. Now we're on the main deck. Each five inch gun sits on its own handling room. So we are in the upper handling room for mount 56. The five inch gun mounts are numbered first five to tell you that they're five inch and then uh, one, three, five on the starboard side, two, four, six on the port side. And during World War II, it would have been 50 to 59. Like we said earlier, four of the mounts were removed, so they had to be renumbered. This thing right here is the top of the dredger hoist. So the projectile comes up on that conveyor belt out the top where I can pick it up. And I bring it over here to the fuse setting projectile hoist. The shell is going to go in upside down where the nose fuse is. And as this projectile hoist takes the shell up to the gun house one story above us, it's going to set the fuse. If it's a VT fuse, veritably timed, uh, it just makes that fuse live. If it is a time delayed fuse, it will set the exact time delay that's programmed into it uh, so that this is now live. Up until this point, this has been inert. The fuse setting projectile hoist is two position. So there's one that's always down and the other one's always up. And as you activate the hoist, it just swaps positions so you can keep throwing shells in there. There's one of these for each barrel. So there are two two position hoists. Each handling room, in addition to uh, housing the hoists, also houses tools, electrical equipment, manual backups like this one, and even storage for ammunition. The five inch guns could store ready service ammunition uh, in their upper handling rooms. That way, as the crew is going to general quarters, you don't have to wait for guys to get all the way down in the magazine and start passing stuff up through the dredger hoist. Uh, the first guys to come into the handling room can immediately start grabbing shells and powder canisters out of the ready service lockers and get them to the hoist so that as people start getting up into the gun, that's ready to go. In peacetime, we wouldn't store ready service ammunition up here. It, it would just be an empty rack. In wartime, World War II, you bet we're going to have this stored here. In addition to being able to load shells up into the gun, the dredger hoist can also load them down into the magazine. It'll rotate in either direction. We don't have a complicated hoist system to lower stuff down in the magazine. We just drop stuff into the dredger hoist and run it in reverse to get stuff down. Like I said earlier, there are manual backups. If power is lost and this isn't actuating, you can use wheels like this to hand crank things and keep it going. Obviously, you won't be firing as fast, yeah, but it's something. The powder uh, works similar to the shell. It comes up through the dredger hoist, and on the opposite side of this rotating stalk that is part of the gun mount overhead, uh, we've got a place to load the powder. So you can pull that to open this. You put your powder can in, and it hoists it up, and it pops out through the deck in the gun mount above, and a place will show you. From here, you're no longer sending it up in the aluminum canister. You're just sending up the brass or steel or aluminum shell casing. Uh, the aluminum canisters go out through these holes in the deck. This is called a decanning scuttle. Basically, we're going to fill up with those spent aluminum canisters too quick. Uh, there, there just isn't a lot of room in here. and there would be about 12 guys in here when the gun is in operation. So those spent aluminum canisters, you just drop through the deck here. On older ships, you might be passing them through the door, but what's the point of having an armored door if you're leaving it open? So you drop it right through the deck here and it just falls into whatever space is below. 
The captain's office has a pair of decanning scuttles in the overhead. Some of them drop into other offices, some of them are birthing compartments. So, uh, now we are actually inside the gun house of the 5-inch gun. There would generally be about 14 sailors in a twin mount like this. Uh, on a battleship, there is 2.5 inch of STS armor plate around the gun house. On smaller ships like destroyers, uh, this is enclosed solely uh, as weather protection and splinter protection. It doesn't actually have armor plate. There are also open mount 5 inch guns called pedestal mounts. First up, the powder comes out of a hole in the deck like that. So you pick that up and it goes into the breech of the gun right here. Next, the shell comes up from that fuse setting projectile hoist. Here's one here. I kick that open and this door should pop open if it was uh, well oiled. And then the shell just falls right out in my hands. So I bring this over here. And you'll notice there's a lip there. So that at whatever angle we're loading this, and this gun can go from positive 85 to negative five degrees, uh, whatever angle we're at, I can set this on the lip while I'm waiting for the other guy who's doing powder to drop that in. Because this, if I drop it in before the powder, it falls in and then it falls back and you can't fit the powder. So this I can't push in because the breech is closed. However, assuming we had just fired or we're about to fire, the breech would be open. I push this in and you can see all sorts of dents and divots in this gun from where it's been used over the years. And uh, once the shell and the powder are in there, then this rammer is going to push it all the way forward so that it's inside the breech of the gun. Notice there's a lip around the base of the powder canister. That lip uh, is going to engage something on the breech block and cause it to pop up automatically. When that breech block pops up, the breech is closed, this weapon is ready to fire. The rammer right here has just pushed that up. So when the breech block pops up, it pops up from this rail that it's been riding on up to this rail. And it falls back down along this rail to this position. You push that and it drops back into firing position. So now you can throw another powder, another shell in here. Once this is fired, the breech drops open and an extractor grabs that lip and kicks that spent casing out. Behind the gun is a guy wearing asbestos gloves. He's the hot shellman and he is going to make sure that that shell ejects out of the breech of the gun and out of a small door cut into the back of the gun's armor uh, so that it gets out of there. So again, we don't have uh, powder canisters just stacking up in here. But once it's out on deck, it sort of just sits there. And normally that's fine. However, there have been fire missions that New Jersey and other ships have performed where these canisters start to stack up, in which case other guys have to come out and like sweep them overboard, get them out of the way. Uh, oftentimes you could try and save your powder canisters. You might be able to reload them. Uh, or uh, at different times throughout the U.S. Navy, you could take this uh, valuable brass scrap to, say, the Philippines and give a bunch of it to a group of painters there and they'll paint the whole hull of the ship for it. And they take the brass and they can work it into uh, ornamentation or jewelry or, or scrap it and sell it like that. So uh, that was done a lot throughout the history of the U.S. Navy. It is sort of frowned upon today. They don't tend to save brass for that sort of thing anymore. We're talking about your grandfather's Navy here, back when Subic Bay was a thing. So, uh, talking about a 14-man gun crew, where does everyone stand? We're going to flash on screen a diagram that shows where everyone is. Basically, you're standing perfectly still. There's not enough room to move around, and every position uh, in this place is filled with a person. In addition to the various loaders that I've just showed off, we would have a gun captain who's basically standing on the uh, cabinet back here, and from there he can stick his head out the top. And we would also have people sitting up between the barrels and on each side. Those are your trainers and pointers. When this gun is not slave to a director and slewing around automatically, these guys can manually control where it goes and even 
more manually wheel it if we lose electrical power. Uh, and then in the middle, you've got somebody setting deflection, which is uh, we've got a fire control computer. It has told us where to shoot. Hey, maybe we're a little bit further forward than the other guns or a little bit further aft. And uh, maybe we're shooting and our shells are uh, dropping in the wrong place. But we can manually input deflection there and it will help bring our guns on target. The 5-inch 38 was effective partially because of its heavy stopping power. A 55-pound projectile exploding will shoot down an aircraft, even a kamikaze, uh, but also largely because of its rate of fire. This gun can fire up to uh, one round every four seconds, or 15 rounds per minute. That's what the Navy says you've got to train for. So that's really great. Uh, and in fact, many ships, like Battleship New Jersey, had a practice loading machine uh, where you could stand around it and practice loading the gun to get up to that high rate of fire. Well, the great thing about manual guns as opposed to automatic guns is you can increase your rate of fire. In an automatic gun that's just being loaded mechanically, how fast it shoots is how fast it shoots. But with a manual gun, if those guys train really hard on the practice loader and in combat, well, they can get that rate of fire up. So we have recorded rates of fire from five inch guns of 22 rounds a minute. So less than three seconds between each shot. The 24 guys down in the magazine are pulling a shell and a powder canister, getting it on a hoist. That dredger hoist is taking it up to the upper handling room. In the upper handling room, another group of 12 guys is moving that from the hoist that came up on the dredger hoist to the hoist that's actually gonna take it up into the gun mount. It's two separate hoists so that an explosion up here doesn't go all the way down to the magazine. There's an offset there. It comes up to the gun house and then the 14 guys up here in the gun house are simultaneously aiming their guns to match what the rangefinder and the computer is telling them to do and dropping projectiles into this thing at whatever angle it might be at. It's at a, a very convenient, I don't know, 15 degrees right now but uh, against aircraft, we might be up closer to 85 degrees shooting at dive bombers, or we might be uh, lower shooting at torpedo planes. So, so this thing could be slewing around. We're rotating in here, and this isn't always gonna be at the same angle. So every three seconds, these guys are just dropping these 55 pound projectiles and 22 pound powder canisters into this and shooting them off. As we increase the size of five inch guns, it becomes impossible to make them manual anymore. Uh, so, for example, the American 5-inch 38 did significantly better than the British 5-inch 25 because the projectile at 55 pounds is manageable. For the 5.25-inch uh, gun of British battleships was too heavy, so it was slow to fire. And by the time the U.S. Navy switches to a 5-inch 54 caliber gun after World War II with a 70-pound projectile, they have to switch to auto loading because it's just too difficult to load a 70 pound projectile every three or four seconds. What do you think was the most effective anti-aircraft weapon of World War II? My vote is for the five inch 38, but you might have another opinion. Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of businesses and private individuals. This video has been sponsored by the Smokowitz family in memory of their patriarch who served in gun systems like this on Battleship Nevada during World War II. For a $500 donation, the museum may be able to let you fire one of the ship's five inch guns. Make sure you contact us in advance so we can ensure one of the members of our gun crew is on hand when you wanna visit the ship. There's also a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support our channel. And another way you can support us is by liking, sharing, and subscribing. That way other people know that we're out here and it really helps the museum out. Thanks for watching.